Michigan Out of Doors Online is brought to you in part by Mr. Muskie Charters, offering full-service guided fishing trips for walleye, muskie, bass, and sturgeon on Lake St. Clair and the Detroit and St. Clair Rivers. Booking information is online at mrmuskiecharters.com. By Tri-County Logging. Experienced in sustainable forestry practices, Tri-County Logging can help you manage your property by keeping your woods healthy and generate income. Serving southern and mid-Michigan for nearly 50 years, tricountylogging.com. Hey everybody, welcome to Michigan Out of Doors. I'm Jenny olson Silic, and we've got an exciting show lined up for you this week. I'll take you out in the dark on the St. Clair River where we're chasing after sturgeon with an old pro and somebody who's brand new at the sport. You won't want to miss that story. Before we get to that, we're going to continue our talks on CWD. Well, that's right, Jenny. We are going to have part two in our three-part series on deer management and specifically chronic wasting disease management here in the state of Michigan. You won't want to miss this week's show. We're going to interview Doug Roberts from Conquest Sense, who's a deer farmer here in the state of Michigan. Very unique perspective on this topic. So lots of good stuff on this week's show. You stay tuned. I'm Jimmy Gretzinger. It's time for Michigan Out of Doors. From the first spring rains to the soft summer breeze, dancing on the pine forest floor. The autumn colors catch your eyes, here come the crystal winter skies. It's Michigan, Michigan out of doors. What a beautiful day in the woods. Someday our children all will see this is their finest legacy. The wonder and the love of Michigan as the wind comes whispering through the trees. The sweet smell of nature's in the air. Great lakes to the quiet stream, shining like a sportsman's dream. It's a love of Michigan we all share. Michigan Out of Doors is presented by By Country Smokehouse, a sportsman's meat processor and Michigan destination since 1988. Offers a variety of homemade smoked meats and Michigan-made products in-store and online. The Country Smokehouse features an outdoor barbecue and bar. Details at countrysmokehouse.com. By G5 Outdoors makers of the Quest and Prime bows, manufactured and designed in Memphis, Michigan. G5 offers a line of archery bows, broadheads, and accessories on the web at g5outdoors.com. To those who say we can't build a healthy economy while protecting the environment, DTE Energy has something to say. We're already doing it. Because you don't get to the forefront of cleaner, efficient energy by talking about it. DTE Energy. Soaking in the rich tradition of Michigan hunting for over 30 years, Vanguard is proud to sponsor our friends at Michigan Out of Doors TV. Well, hey, we are here today with Doug from Conquest Sense. He's the owner here and has been working with deer for, what, how many years now? 27. 20, so you're getting this figured out. I'm getting old. <laughs> <laughs> well, when we're talking about chronic wasting disease, we're talking about baiting, we're talking about the ban on baiting, the ban on scents or certain scents, uh, we thought you would be an expert person because you deal with congregating deer. And so when we talk about uh, the baiting ban, from your perspective and your expertise is is the baiting ban a good thing, a bad thing? Is it gonna make a hill of beans a difference or is it the, it's gonna save the day? What's, what's your thoughts? Over the last 30 years, history has shown us that the processes that we've done for CWD and trying to stop the movement of, or actually shut it down uh, really has not worked. Mm -hmm. Now, if you look at viral or bacterial, tuberculosis, we have that in Michigan, that's a highly contagious disease. That absolutely needs to be stopped because it can be spread by baiting and feeding deer. And we know that for a fact. There's been no studies done on a prion disease to see how it's really spread. We're assuming that it's the same way. So we've adopted that process and moved it over to the prion. Um, in my opinion, the jury's still out on that, but the DNR only has so many tools at their disposal to try to stop the spread of CWD. And so banning, baiting, and feeding is one of those. So from your perspective, you got however many deer, hundreds of deer, and they're in close proximity to each other. Um, what has been your, your with CWD, have you had it here? Have you not had it here in, in the deer industry? Is that a kind of, where does that 
the deer farming industry does have CWD in it, mm -hmm. absolutely, but it's at lower concentrations than what we're finding in the wild herd. Mm -hmm. Now, we're masters at congregating deer, but we also have very safe feeding practices, healthy feeding practices. We always feed off the ground. We always have clean feeders. We rotate those feeders. You know, we, we clean the area around those feeders. So we have higher concentrations, yet we have lower disease issues. Hmm. So is there something to that? Is it, can we educate the hunters in maybe baiting and feeding in a different manner than just throwing it on the ground where, yeah, all kinds of diseases and bacteria. I mean, naturally in the ground, you've got coccidiosis, giardia. I mean, it goes on and on that a deer can naturally catch. And when you congregate them, those things can become very, very detrimental to the deer herd. So do you think the baiting ban and the ban on scents does that make sense to, in your perspective or not? In my judgment, I'm not sure. I, I honestly don't think so. Hmm. Um, but do I have another answer for them to give? Uh, it would be try feeding and baiting a different way. Like I said, get it up off the ground. That's a huge one. Um, but they're using, again, the tools that they have right now, which uh, I think they're lacking. Our industry is really working hard on a lot of research of trying to figure out what is CWD, how is it really spread, and then are there things that can shut it down? Um, and, and we're finding that uh, there's possibly some of those things that are out there. Um, genetic resistance. Sheep and scrapies and sheep, we found that there was resistant strains that just couldn't get scrapies. And hmm. so the industry bred those and wiped out the other ones. And literally in 15 years, there's scrapies does not exist in the US. Hmm. And we found those genetic markers in white-tailed deer as well. So in the farming industry, we're now starting to breed those. So we can literally, we're thinking we can breed a level of resistance into the deer where they won't catch CWD. Doesn't mean they're immune to it. It means that their timeline of catching the disease would become larger we would have more time to take them out hunting, car accidents, you know, all of those other issues that happen uh, rather than catching the disease. Now, it, from my perspective, if we go with kind of what the DNR is saying that nose to nose spreads CWD, wouldn't a facility like yours, if you had one deer, it should spread like wildfire. It should go crazy. But it doesn't. It hasn't. Uh, the two farms in Michigan that have had CWD have both had one animal and we have killed hundreds of animals off those farms. One was depopulated completely mm -hmm. over in Greenville, and it was the only animal they found. The other farm has killed, I believe, 300 or just over 300 animals, still only that one animal. It just seemed to be that one animal somehow got that disease in it. Uh, how we got it, we're not sure, because it was double fenced, it, it was a closed herd. Mm -hmm. um, but again, so out of all of the 300 plus farms and ranches in Michigan, we only had two animals, hmm. and yet how many positives in the wild? So there's something else to this equation that we're missing. Um, we actually, there's a fertilizer called humic acid. And what we think we're finding is that releases metals. What we're thinking is, is that this prion disease is caused by metals being accumulated in the deer's body. So if they were accumulated in our body as humans, our kidneys would start to fail, uh, these metals would start to mess with our brain. We'd start to show the same symptoms as CWD animals would. Hmm. Humic acid seems to break that up and allow the body to release those metals. Hmm. Uh, manganese, uh, copper, all of those types of metals that are in minerals and, and stuff. If we can get it to release, we're thinking it can actually neutralize CWD positive animals. Really? That's what our industry is looking at. And if that shows true, we can, we can attack this system completely different. Not only can we potentially eradicate a, a piece of property, you know, a food plot, but we can also maybe eliminate positive animals and, and make them negative by them releasing that, as long as they're not too severe. Hmm. Well, now, when you, you know, all the cards on the table, you own a scent manufacturing company, and now there's a little bit of, I think, uh, confusion on what we can and can't do with scents. <laughs> So what can we and what can't we do with scents this upcoming season? There's a tremendous amount of confusion right now. Um, here's, what, here's what you can do in Michigan. Any scents that are approved by the ATA Deer Protection Program, and there's a little circle with an ATA check mark on it. Okay. Every major scent company 
that is in any archery, any store, sporting goods store, will have that symbol on it, okay? 99% okay? of us are all in that program. Those are all completely legal to use in the state of Michigan. Okay. Now, the NRC Commission just this past week added one new thing. Any scent that is made of food or smells like food has to be placed where a deer cannot touch it, lick it, or eat it. And so someone who's in this industry, this obviously is going to affect you and your family and your farm. And what is your take on this whole, <laughs> on the ban on baiting and, and scents like this? Is this, do you like, hey, yep, I think we should do this because it's the right thing to do, or is this, this is just crazy talk? If, if we look at the baiting and feeding ban w with just CWD, I don't think it will change the outcome or the spread of CWD. I think it's going to continue to spread at the, at the percentage rate it's, it is currently doing. Okay. If we look at it from the TB area that we have in Michigan and that area is spreading, we absolutely have to stop baiting and feeding because that is spread extremely quickly through baiting and feeding and congregating deer. And so we know that about that, but we don't know that about the prions. That's seriously. correct, that's okay. correct. And that, that's, that's where a lot of hunters are frustrated. But if you look at the map of Michigan, it's very interesting. If you look at the increase of the TB zone and you look at the area of CWD, that zone, that makes up at least, I think, half of the lower peninsula. So what parts in, what, if they were to do some in and some out, it, it becomes very confusing again in that sense. Okay. So I, my gut instinct says the DNR says, let's just do the whole lower peninsula because then there's no confusion. So Doug, as we just kind of wrap things up, um, kind of big picture, is CWD something that you think is really being spread deer to deer? Is it something that's just in our environment and has been here for a long time? What, what's, your, what's your take on that? I think it's more of an environmental disease. In other words, I don't think it's been here forever. I think deer actually have that and then they can shed the prions and they can contaminate an environment. Hmm. So I think what's happened over the years is it maybe started out west. Well, where do we all go to trophy hunt? Hmm. And for years, what did we do? We drove out there, we shot that trophy, we put it in our vehicle, we drove home and we processed it here. Taxidermist process, meat processor, what did we do with the spoils? Dump them out back, and what do you have? You have a contaminated environment. And so I think the animals are getting the disease out of the environment and then recontaminating either new environments hmm. as we as hunters move carcasses around unknowingly. Yeah. No one does it intentionally, right. but I think it's happened. And, and then the deer pick it up out of the food sources, the soils, and such like that. Which makes sense because if, if you have a, a deer in your facility, right, you know, where we've had them in Michigan, one CWD deer in that herd, it should have spread. If it's nose to nose, every deer just about in that whole thing should have it. And Absolutely. that did not happen. Even in that pen, and it did not happen. In either instance, it did not happen. And you're kind of on the, I mean, your industry and is, is, is wanting to get to the bottom of this, I think probably as much or more than anybody. Oh my goodness, yes. Do you see, is the, is the research, is the science, are we months away, years away? Do you think there's going to be some big dominoes to fall where we kind of figure some of this stuff out soon? You know, we, our industry has come up with a live test uh, that we can actually test animals to see if they have the disease right then and there. Uh, and there's a small window of maybe it's in their system, but it hasn't gotten to the lymph nodes or to um, certain areas. But it, it's quite accurate. Hmm. So that's just come out. Humic acid uh, is another one that seems to degrade the infection out of the prions and or the animals. And so we're studying that. And I think that one, we could see some results within months. Okay. I really do. So there's some stuff happening, though, that there's you, some you stuff feel positive happening. about. Okay. And then the genetic resistance. If we can prove that those allies are resistant and, and will keep that deer from getting catching the disease over a longer period of time so we can push it out, and we can harvest that animal, a healthy animal, rather than a disease animal. I think those two things, we're going to start seeing some results. I would love to say in a few months to within a half a year. Okay. Well, we sure appreciate your time, sir. Oh, thanks for coming. Thank you much. Good to see you. I'd like to get a tour of this place. I'll give you a tour right now. <laughs>
Well, special thanks to Doug Roberts for sitting down with us and sharing his thoughts on chronic wasting disease management here in the state of Michigan. Now, last week we had Russ Mason from the DNR. This week was Doug Roberts, and next week will be Ted Nugent. It's really the full spectrum on all the different thoughts and opinions that are out there when it comes to chronic wasting disease management. Hopefully, when we get done with this, you'll be a little bit more informed. You know, it's always exciting hitting the water and chasing after some of those larger species of fish we have here in Michigan. And the lake sturgeon is definitely one of those. In this next story, we head out with somebody who's very well versed at catching sturgeon and a brand new person to the sport. Yeah, we're going to go out on the first trip of the year for me. We're going to go out tonight and we're going to feed some sturgeon and hopefully not the mosquitoes. <laughs> We got the, the back end of the rain here. There's a little rain pass through earlier, so we got, uh, I think, really good weather conditions tonight. It's a little bit cloudy, and uh, winds are going to settle down a little bit, and we're just going to uh, we're going to fish hard. So, I've lived out here my whole life, and I've never caught a sturgeon right in my backyard. So, <laughs> all right, we're going to see if Jim can get it done. Yep, all I'm right. excited. <laughs> she tells me she's been fishing for walleyes before, but never caught a sturgeon. So. Once she gets her first one, she'll be just like me. She'll be spoiled on them, and she'll be switching gears in July. <laughs> we were in for an exciting night. I've been on Jim's boat many times over the years, and he always manages to find the fish for all the first-timers he's hosted out here on the St. Clair River. We're setting up just off the first drop-off. We're going to be at about 32 feet of water right here, so uh, hopefully we can get a fish before dark. Right. If not... Uh, the game plan is we're going to try this spot for starters and give it maybe an hour and a half, two hours at most. If it doesn't work out, we're going to move. That's the game plan tonight, so we're going to get set up here. We're not going to get too fancy tonight. We're going to keep it real simple. Uh, we've got a slip sinker rig. That sinker just rides on a snap swivel by the main line. Everything on here is 50 pound test. So we're going to put a big gob of crawlers on here. We're going to drop a couple straight down off the side and then we're going to put a couple off the back corners. And I'm going to actually hold one of the rods and feel for a bite. Heavy duty rod, kind of a sensitive tip. And I'm on bottom here. And a lot of backbone in that rod so we can fight a big fish. And we're all set. First one in. You just watch the rod tip, eh? As the sun goes down, it gets a little more difficult to see those rod tips out here on the river. Jim showed us an old trick of the trade. He takes glow-in-the-dark bracelets and zip ties them to the ends of the rods so they're highly visible in the dark. He was in the middle of doing just that when we had a taker at the end of the line. There he is. Fish on, fish on. Could be a catfish, could be a sturgy. Let me check that drag. It's, you're good. It's a decent fish. It's a decent fish. Oh, maybe it is. Holy moly. Get a master angler cat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Woo! you do. Whoa. Get him over here, wait there. Our target species, but uh, you want to hold on to them? Watch those spines there. I, just, I don't know That's if I'm going to write my hands up big enough. <laughs> Pretty sweet. Yeah. Uh, we have All right. in. Yep. Oh, gently. So long, little guy. Yep. <laughs> All right, that's the warm up now. So that's yep. the warm up. Yep, we're just you know. getting started. <laughs> yep. Yeah, just we're uh, uh, one catfish, one walleye here. So we've been here for a little while. We're gonna pull up rods, gonna make a move up to another spot that's treated us well over the years. So we, uh, we've caught a few fish in that other spot. We're gonna go back there and see if we can't make it work again tonight. Got us a big fish here. That's a sturgy. That's a sturgy. Oh, really? Oh. Yeah, he's a sturgy. All right. Keep some tension on him. I'm gonna get these other rods cleared. Okay. Give me a little time to get these rods cleared. All right. I'll just keep the tension, right? Yeah. Right off the bat, things got a little crazy out here. One of the other lines got tangled with McKenna's line and was causing some trouble. Jim wasted no time cutting that line to give McKenna control of her line. We got a big fish on there. He just jumped really high in the air too. Well, he got tangled up. They, he got across that other line before I could get it out of the water. So rather than uh, 
trying to fight that fish on two rods, getting even more tangled up. I just cut that line, let that sinker and that other hook go so that she could have a, a clear shot at landing this fish. You know, it's her first fish. It's a great big giant fish. And, uh, you know, we just don't want to lose that. So we're going to do everything we can to get this thing into the boat. He wants to run, let him run. What do you think, Jim? I think it's not a bad fish for the first fish of the year. <laughs> and to have this young lady here to catch him, that's even more of a bonus. You know, I, uh, I spent a lot of time out here with people just like her, getting them into their first sturgeon. Ooh, cool. oh, maybe not. There he goes. He's going to take off. He's going to fight you a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he's, he's clear and he's on rope. Tighten looks... up on him. Steer him. Pull him away from the, the motor if you can. Oh, he's, he's belly up. He's, uh... Yeah, he's, he's a little bit wrapped up here. He's the one tired fish. Reel right down to the sinker. Reel right down to the sinker. Okay, now hang on here. Hold on. Hey, hang on. Hang on. This is big. I'm going to get the head under one end here. Is it reel down enough? Reel down to the sinker. Reel down to the sinker. Reel down right to the sinker. All right. There you go. Okay. All right. Come on. I want to get that this tail in there. Hang on. <laughs> Come on. There we go. He's in the net. Good. Heavy fish is a big fish. Do you need help? Yep, I do. You might have to. Yep. There we go. Oh. That is a giant. <laughs> what? That. Oh that my cow. gosh. That is a giant. Wow. Yeah, you know, before I left the house today, of course, I went through the boat and I made sure we had sandwiches and lights and mosquito repellent and safety gear and everything we needed to fish for sturgeon except for the measuring tape. So what we did is we laid him against the side of the boat here and I, I kind of paced him off with my 12 inch shoes and we figure he's a little over five feet. You know, he's probably been swimming in this river maybe since about the time that I was born. So, and I just turned 65. So, you know, I, I put that fish at over 50 years. That, that fish is, uh, he's gotta be 80 pounds anyways. It's a big fish. A lot of girth, you know, some of these smaller fish we get aren't near this fat. This is a big, healthy, beautiful fish. That was, that thing's bigger <laughs> around than you. I know. <laughs> I think Great laying job. down, he'd be almost as tall as me, yeah. too. <laughs> Great. So I'm just going to give him a little push here and let him go. Watch him swim away. Come on, baby. Yeah. There he goes. Perfect. Okay. All right, high five. Woo! <laughs> Good job. I mean, that was a lot of weight to reel in, and that thing fought you like crazy. Yeah, my arm's tired, but I could keep going. <laughs> well, we're going to keep going. If you guys yeah. are game, I'm, right, I'm yeah. ready for another one. <laughs> okay. We were questioning the size of this net, but now we know it came in handy. <laughs> Yeah, that was not overkill, was it? Nope, definitely not. <laughs> well, we wouldn't be needing the net for the next fish on, but it was another exciting one. We thought it was a catfish, so McKenna bowed out and let Jim reel it in. It ended up being a juvenile sturgeon, which is really neat to see up close. Look at that! So how old do they say these size are? You know what? We raised these fish in our sturgeon in the classroom program. In one year, they're almost this big. Okay. Ouch, man, he is sharp. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm glad that McKenna got the big one and I got the little one. <laughs> yeah, you ready? Oh, he's ready to go. There he goes. He's lively. <laughs> With all the excitement already tonight, we thought we'd fish for a few more minutes and call it a day. And wouldn't you know it, another rod went off and McKenna was bringing in a third sturgeon of the night. The only place in Michigan we have a very long, a very liberal sturgeon season here. You know, there's only a few areas in the state where you can fish for those. And, uh, you know, we want people to come and, and visit the local businesses, take advantage of the fishery, spend some money here, of course. And uh, it's good for the economy and uh, introduce people to what we have right here in the backyard. But yeah, what a great experience. And if she becomes a regular sturgeon angler here, uh, that would just warm my soul. 
and that's what Sturgeon for Tomorrow here is all about, sharing the experience with others. The North Channel Sturgeon Classic is happening here in Algonac on September 21st and 22nd. In addition to the fishing tournament, it's becoming a festival with family fun and activities similar to the winter sturgeon shivery at Black Lake. What an awesome way to celebrate these great fish here in Michigan's Out of Doors. Thanks for joining us this week for Michigan Out of Doors. Make sure you stick around in upcoming weeks. Of course, we'll have the continuation of our talks on CWD and the deer herd here in Michigan. We're also going to have some fun fishing for you. We'll take a look at a 4-H kids fishing event. We'll chase after some musky, some bass, all kinds of summertime fun still headed your way as we transition into our fall seasons here at the show. If you're wondering where we are and where we're headed next, you can always check us out online. Well, that's right, Jenny. Online is a great way to kind of keep tabs on us. Of course, our website, michiganoutofdoorstv.com. Full episodes of the show there every week. We're also on most of the social media sites. And if you're ever on YouTube, you can subscribe to our channel there and get an email every time we post something new. Make sure you join us next week. We'll have part three in our three-part series, kind of wrap up this whole uh, discussion about chronic wasting disease here in the state of Michigan. I'm sure we'll be talking about it for years to come. And we're going to have some good fishing coming up. And you know what? The hunting seasons, well, they're actually underway now here in the great state of Michigan. What a great time to be a sportsman here in the state of Michigan. Hopefully, if we don't see you in the woods or on the water, we'll see you right back here next week on your PBS station. Michigan Out of Doors is presented by by Greenstone Farm Credit Services, making recreational land ownership possible across Michigan and Northeast Wisconsin. Begin your land financing journey at one of Greenstone's 37 locations or greenstonefcs.com. By EOTech, a Michigan company, equipping law enforcement and sportsmen alike with quality optics, creating jobs for Michigan workers. On the web at eotechgear.com. By Huron Lady River Cruises in Port Huron, offering daily sightseeing trips and private cruises for all ages. Sightseers will experience the International Blue Water Bridge, Great Lakes Freighters, the Fort Gratiot Lighthouse, and more. Huron Lady River Cruises on the web at huronlady.com. Closed captioning provided by Randy's Hunting Center, serving Michigan as Ruger and Leupold's National Dealer of the Year, an inventor of Ruger's 450 Bushmaster rifle. When I want to fire I am a Michigan man Changing seasons paint the scene Like rainbow trout in a hidden stream The white-tailed deer in the tall pine trees I am a Michigan man I am, I am a Michigan man Ask where I'm from and I'll show you my hand